Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, I just want to thank Shahzad for asking me to participate in today's conference. Um, I'm happy to be here and to be learning from all these wonderful papers. Uh, for this session, our respondent will be Anne Murphy from the University of British Columbia, and her time starts now. <laughs> She's promised to play hardball, so I have to hurry. But I want to, th um, now that we've got the picture out of the way, um, I want to thank Shazad for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here again as someone who's not in this field, directly in this field. It's really an honor to be here to listen to these papers and to have an opportunity to respond to them, and also to Barbara for her help in getting me here. Thank you. And it's also a particular pleasure because I did my undergraduate degree at Brown a long, long time ago. Um, I had a concentration, I forgot that they were called concentrations, in religious studies. And so it's really, um, really something to come back as a professor, which when I was an undergraduate, I never imagined I could become. So you never know for the undergraduates in the room what might happen. Uh, and I'm proof of that. So um, I'm, it was really a pleasure to read these two papers and I'm gonna give a brief uh, summary as I was asked to and then pose some questions that hopefully um, we can um, bring it will bring us into the Q&A period and then um, really looking forward to hearing from everyone else um, and I'm not sure how to say pronounce people's names Kaya yeah. Sai Sahin Shahin oh, okay so um, so um, Dr. Shahin's paper um, I found fascinating thank you very much um, so it asks us, what constitutes an event? How do we define eventness? Um, the paper invites us to consideration this, um, question, consider this question in some depth, alongside other questions regarding the nature of historical representation in different genres, languages, and contexts. The subject of the, of the paper is a series of what the author calls operatic events or festivals. Different terms are utilized at different points. <coughs> public circumcision celebrations enacted in the Ottoman context from the 15th to the 16th centuries, with a focus on the memorialization of a late 16th century example of that. And the use of the different terms, uh, you know, operatic event, festival, etc., is exactly kind of the point. Um, uh, as the author argues um, that the point is to trace from 1457, which was the time of the first independent circumcision celebration in Adrianople, and Adrianople, Adrianople, is that right? Okay, to 1582. A transition from an, what he calls an official court ceremoni ceremonial to an event that looks like a festival. This is the period that's associated with a new Ottoman ceremonial cu culture, he tells us, and it's later enactments and embellishment in celebrations in 1582 after um, uh, two very visible um, so celebrations in 1530 and 1539 provide an opportunity to see um, what, uh, how the rule of Murad III um, was drawing on these previous ceremonies but then expanding on them in significant ways. And there were lots of commonalities between this 15, uh, 1530 and 1532 uh, events and the later events in 1582, um, gift giving rituals, different kinds of games, parades, banquets, etc. So in that way, we're kind of replicating the, um, the form of the event from in 1582 based on the 1530 event. But at the same time, there was innovation, reflecting political developments such as a war with Safavid Iran and internal economic and political tensions. So overall, the author tells us that in some, the earlier such spectacles or performances focused on gift giving, feasting, and the demonstration of skills while the guild parade, and I want to know a little bit more about what that looked like, and public articulation of political and sexual innuendo were more pronounced in 1582. The real heart of the paper is its exploration of a range of sources available for the reconstruction of the 1582 event, primarily archival records and literary works that include both histories and what he calls books of celebration, or sornami that narrates the preparations for celebrations, the event itself, and the participants. It's through these sources that the author seeks to draw out what it means to talk about an event, how, how eventness 
is constructed in the minds of late 16th century Ottoman bureaucrats and literati. So in broad terms, then, the paper is really a meditation on source, <coughs> on knowledge formation that is produced out of a range of sources, and on genre. And the event is kind of the locus of that investigation. I think one really striking feature of the work is its focus on this new genre that comes into the fore at this moment in time, the Sorname, or Books of Celebration. And the author provides us three important examples of the genre. The first of these, um, by Mustafa Ali, presents what the author calls a realistic narrative that's documentary in focus. But it also organizes knowledge about the events in thematic terms. So not just pure reportage, but using a thematic narrative. The other two are one by Intizami, whose prose text, unlike the other earlier text, which was verse, um, is concerned with um, issues around replication, around the fact of whether or not these events um, replicate effectively the 1530 and 1532 um, events, or so it seems to me in my reading of the paper. And then also the third work is a recently discovered text by Farahi that is presented as more accessible and less elite and giving a more de generic narrative that gives way to a documentary account. The author then contrasts these with historical narratives, which take this event and place it in a broad context. So we're no longer just thinking about the event in itself and all its constitutive parts, but instead um, a broader sweep of, of history, where he says that writing history in the 16th century had become a panacea against the malaise of the time. And that's where we see the 1582 events placed in a larger context. So the author ends the paper actually with a series of important questions that would be fruitful for all of us to return to, such as what does it mean to even call these texts Islamic? What is, what is the role of Islam in them? Or, or also early modern or Ottoman. How do these terms um, inf inform our reading of these texts? He also asks about authorial purpose and reception and the nature of historical writing itself. So I'm going to add a few questions to those questions that he gave us. <coughs> So the author notes that um, before, when the members of the Ottoman dynasty married members of neighboring dynasties, dynasties, circumcisions were part of the wedding celebration. So you had these large um, um, celebrations for weddings, and then circumcisions were a part of them. And it's only after the transition from marriage to concubinage as the, as the source of biological reproduction of the Ottoman dynasty that male circumcisions came to the fore uh, in these kinds of public celebrations. And this really fascinated me, and it really invites, I think, an, oppor an opportunity to bring in a history of women uh, into this um, dynasty spectacle that we have before us through these texts. You can add to this, I think, add the, to the complexity of what that story could be when we consider a point that he makes on page four that about the age of the prince to be circumcised. So the prince was born in 1566, so by 1582 he was already a young man. So he argues that this may be why it was urgent for them to perform the circumcision at that time when he was 16 years old. But that's striking, I think. And it really calls attention to the very bodily fact of circumcision, um, which is itself a deeply engendering bodily practice. And you can add to that another layer that he provides us, that after, or right, I think, right before the circumcision of the prince, um, there's a ritual circumcision of a large number of orphaned boys in the cities. So we have this kind of replication, this serialized enactment of masculine, masculinized bodies um, that I think can actually help us to read Ottoman authority in a very interesting way. Um, and also to put it in tension with the ways in which women's bodies are mobilized for reproduction and then effectively erased through non-marriage as not wives. So this engendering of a sex of men is directly linked to the erasure of the productive capacity of women um, and their bodies. So I just say I, I'm just intrigued with, with this kind of opportunity, the opportunity this represents to have a history of erasure alongside a history of presence in terms of gender. My second um, question or thing I'm interested in knowing more about um, it relates to um, materiality. So the author has mentioned the need to address the complex relationship between text and image uh, 
and his project between the text and illustrations in the manuscripts. But I wonder if it might be taken just a step further. Gift-giving rituals are mentioned early on in the paper. Um, and it's clear that the texts that he's working with have engaged with this materiality in quite um, extensive detail. There are lists of gifts mentioned, and some of the archival records are really actually a history of gift giving more than anything else. Here we're kind of returning to Sean's bundles of meaning and practice and how they relate to um, histori historiography. So there's an object story here that I think comes to us through these texts that's quite important. But that doesn't mean it's separate from the text because we get to the objects through the text, so they're, in, they're implicated. Um, the materialities of the preparations for the celebrations are explicated quite well from page eight on. I hope I'll be okay, time-wise. Um, and that brings a lot of texture and concreteness, but I just would invite uh, the author to perhaps consider um, these, these objects and the kind of way telling this story from the perspective of these objects and, might be particularly interesting. What does material culture history and object exchange history have to tell us about these events and the relationships that they established, the forms of power that they instantiated, and the social practices that they inaugurated or were continuing? Because as we know, in 1582, they were replicating earlier practices. So um, since I'm running lower on time than I thought. I have an extra couple minutes. OK. Don't cut anything else. OK. So thank you. <laughs> I'm grateful. Um, I think also the history of objects as represented in texts is an, a valuable opportunity to think about genre more broadly. So we're thinking about um, historical narration, but also think about these material forms that are brought to us through texts. And not to do that, uh, make the mistake that was discussed earlier of separating object or material history from the textual, because they're deeply implicated. OK, I'll move on to the second essay, which is also a pleasure to read. Um, and thank you for it, by Dana Sajdi. Sajdi. So the essay opens with an overview of the emergence of landscape um, in the 15th century and cityscape painting in the late 17th, the Netherlands, 17th century in the Netherlands and the 18th century in Italy, in Europe. So that's a kind of opening salvo she makes. As an entry into the consideration of the emergence of what the author calls a complete and articulated image of Damascus which predates these European developments considerably. It happening in the 12th century, when the city surged back to life after several centuries of decline. This image, so created, however, is a literary one, not a pictorial image, although she makes clear there were pictorial images that predated the text, so it's not, uh, again, we shouldn't see a distinction, an absolute distinction between image and text here. The author argues that this account of Damascus that emerges at the end of the 12th century was both canonical in that it launched a new genre of texts and canonizing, such that, as she, I'm going to quote her, uh, Damascus was for the first time released into secular time and space. And then uh, she explicates this further on page uh, 16, where the cityscape narrative tradition, quote, wrested Damascus from the grips of divinity. And I have some questions about that because I found that fascinating. The cityscape in the rendering of the paper allows for a deep historical reading of place through layers of texts as well as layers of history as embedded in text. The author provides a rendering of the city of Damascus in the post-Caliphate setting as being marked by what she calls a new monumental architecture, and I'm quoting her here, which betokened nothing less than a new social contract on which both the professional scholar and the sultan were signatories. This was because this was a time when hereditary authority was unavailable to the sultan and other elites who were not descended from the family of the prophet. And so these were other means of establishing and popularizing that authority. So she argues this is tied to the narrative project of rendering the city in words, <coughs> embedding these elites in the topography of the city and ensuring their hegemony as presenters and representatives of these cities. So the past and present coexist in these cityscapes. The account that she uh, gives us of Azakir, Az Azakir, Azakir. Az Azakir, Azakir of the Umayyad Mosque, thus is partially description and partially history, and takes into account 
controversial aspects of the mosque's history, and in that way, she argues, does a kind of whitewashing. She it washes it clean and makes it available to the author to uh, represent within the present and in the future. The author um, emphasizes that um, the movement, the sense of movement um, that we heard earlier um, discussed, that's embedded within the cityscape narrative, and that this is definitive of the genre, defining it as a unique aspect of the vision of the city and the region that's produced through the narrative. The discussion of the state-centric view of the la landscape from the perspective of the state, um, which is administrative in its interest and extractive, I think would be an appropriate term, uh, kind of making the terrain legible, she says, to the revenue-seeking state, <coughs> really does remind us of larger literatures on the colonialism, right? So uh, from my experience in South Asia, I'm as a South Asianist, thinking about em empire and its impact in South Asia and the ways in which imag territorial imaginaries were both um, transformed by the imperial and also co-opted by them. One wonders, um, though, when thinking about that, when thinking about these different kinds of colonial or imperial territorial imaginaries, um, if what is at work is perhaps just an ever more intrusive state system. So we get back to the question of the state. Um, rather than anything intrinsic to any one such system, so, the, so this kind of covetous gaze that you speak of, of Cairo, which really defines the colonial, I think, in a, in a fundamental way. So it just seems to be this extractive voice that's being um, enacted with ever, ever more efficient means. She argues that these cityscapes offered um, the, the residents of Damascus and the authors that she's speaking of the possibility of what she calls returning the gaze. And so it seems we have a kind of subaltern voice here that is speaking against occupying power. Good. So that's how she positions Ibn Tulun's, Ibn Tulun's survey of Al Ghutta, the green belt that surrounds Damascus, a survey of a hinterland, told from the point of view of someone walking through it. So we see this move overall towards, if I understand the argument correctly, and I apologize if I'm wrong, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this move towards this bureauc bureauc bureaucratizing gaze or extractive gaze, and then an answer to that gaze within these texts through a sense of movement through space. This is paralleled and extended in visual terms, um, uh, and again, to a very different form, kind of visual form, with cartography. And she describes different kinds of carto cartographic imaginations of this space. Again, a kind of imperial cartography and then an alternative to it. So here's my questions. Um, since the author invokes the pictorial landscape, cityscape at the beginning, I guess I want to uh, draw attention to what I do think is a radical difference between text and image. Um, that, um, and that is the intrusion of time. And I think that's so central to your argument overall, um, temporality, that I wanted to just call attention to it. So that is, while the ravages of, and gifts of time are visible in the image, there is something inherently static about an image. It is marked by the past and the present and suggests a future, perhaps, but it is fundamentally made static. So I would, I would, I would just push you to perhaps differentiate I think narrative in itself is temporally marked, um, and particularly the, the very works that you're talking about are so marked by a kind of a temporality that really challenges the kind of st uh, static nature of an image, and that's and movement also. Movement is so important to these narratives; it's fundamental to what you are seem to be arguing is a is a kind of um, alterity within the text, um, but that too is temporally marked. So you can see that movement as being a temporal act as well as an act of movement through space. So I think that might give another aspect of what may be unique about these narratives that you're exploring. I also wanted to know a little bit more about what you mean when you say, I understood the can canonical um, aspect of the cityscape narrative, but how is it canonizing? How does it create canons? Um, is the landscape made canonical? And I ask that because I think in some ways you're, um, you're arguing for a uh, decanonizing function for these texts, um, the ways in which they 
call against a bureaucratic and economic consumption of the land. Um, and so that to me is a, a slightly different perspective. So I just wanted to kind of ask you to think a little bit about canonizing. Um, even so, some of the heroes of the story, I think, like Ibn Tulun, um, he does remark on the produce that towns are, are known for, and he comments on the revenue in a given region. So I wonder if perhaps he's not so anti-imperial as, so I wonder, what's the slippage between the bureauc bureaucratizing gaze and extractive gaze and this gaze from within that's arguing for an alternative? The other uh, question had to do with, which I mentioned earlier that I'm, I was curious about, is this notion, is this relationship to divinity? So you say that, um, th that Ibn Tulun has a divine frame and that that in some way diverts pragmatic or economic interests. Um, but firstly, sometimes I, uh, at one level, I think that the, it's more of a normalized act, right, to ascribe um, kind of all to divinity, at the, especially at the opening of a text. So does that actually function to subvert economic interests? Um, and then I, okay, I'm almost done. Um, and then the other part of that is you talked earlier that I quoted you about wresting Damascus from the grips of divinity and bringing it into the secular. So I just wonder what are the complex roles of divinity for you in these texts, in articulating space, in articulating authority, and what does it mean to narrate? How are these stories about divinity and how are they not? So just two short things and I promise I'm getting off here. Um, the one point was also, you mentioned Hadith studies and that several of the people who were involved in these narratives were in, engaged in Hadith studies. And I wondered, what's, what's happening there? That's a really fascinating conjuncture. And just to ask you to maybe comment on that, I loved your use of the term time eaters mm -hmm. and, how, and how they're producing Damas Damascene time. Um, so just to, and does that follow from Hadith studies in some way? And then lastly, um, you noted that um, Damascus cityscapes and chronicle production creates a world onto its own. Um, but you also noted as well that other places have been described and narrativized. So is the only tension, I mean, you, you draw attention, I think, in particular to the imperial versus, uh, to use the term, the occupied, right? Um, the the peripherized, peripheralized, if I can make a, is that a word? Um, and so that comes to the fore, but are there other um, distinctions that hold between the vision of Damascus as it's experienced and walked and lived and recorded and narrated um, and other cityscapes. Because I think that might lead us to a, a even more texture of this kind of theory of history that is a theory of place. Mm -hmm. And place, not just place, but um, place making or, uh, or traversing. Mm -hmm. So I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, I'd actually like to ask both of the paper's authors to come up rather than take time and transition. So we have 10 minutes each. You have 10 minutes each. Uh, is there a preference for who would like to go first, or should we just go in the order of the, yeah. the comment? So our first respondent will be uh, Kaya Shahin of Indiana University, followed by Dennis Ajdi of Boston College. Okay, uh, thank you so much for this uh, detailed uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I'll come back to your questions about circumcision as you know, a bodil bodily and gendering, uh, pra gendered practice. I'll also talk a little bit about materiality. These are important notions. But since uh, you know, I was asked to focus on the sources, uh, that's what I gave primacy to in my paper, and I would like to talk about these a little bit. So during our discussions with Shahzad, we somehow decided that you know, I would say something about events, about something becoming an event, about something being described as a specific event, and I chose this particular uh, circumcision ceremony because of the existence of multiple kinds of sources about it. Uh, we have archival sources, so in other words, these sources circumscribe the event, but in different ways, by producing different kinds of narratives and by producing different types of information about the event itself. We have the correspondence of the Imperial Council concerning the organization of the event, and then you realize that you know, organizing a, an event that goes on for almost uh, you know, uh, 
uh, a month and a half uh, in Istanbul requires a lot of organization, feeding the crowds, you know, uh, organizing artists and artisans, uh, preparing the space, ensuring, you know, an orderly uh, unfolding of the event itself. So on the one hand, we have the event as bureaucratic practice, as we see in the, in the correspondence of the uh, Imperial uh, Council even before the event happens. So it starts becoming visible in this official correspondence. And then there's another kind of archival practice that happens during the event in the form of the listing of, number one, the gifts that are brought to the Sultan by different communities and different individuals, and then number two, uh, by, through the registration of the names and numbers of different communities, artists, performers who take place in the event itself. So we have an archival recording of the event while the event is still going on. You can imagine you know, some Ottoman scribes with you know, pen and paper making note of these things as the event keeps happening. Uh, and the archival uh, anchoring of the event goes even after the event ends because, you know, again, the members of the imperial bureaucracy try to wrap up the loose ends. There are debts to be collected. There is money to be dispersed. Uh, there are some security-related issues. Uh, the imperial council makes sure that, uh, you know, uh, European envoys who come to the event can go back to their, you know, uh, home places safely and securely. So there are these archival practices that give us a vision of the event. Then uh, there are these uh, narrative sources that are devoted to the event itself. Now, before 1582, in Ottoman practice, I mean, there are these large-scale ceremonies which, as you said, I mean, emerge uh, around the mid-15th century, but those ceremonies are usually recorded as part of larger historical works. While in 1582, we see the emergence of what I would like to call a subgenre. I mean, this is not a genre in itself, but it's a kind of a subgenre which is dedicated to this particular event itself. And we have other examples of this subgenre uh, later on uh, for later festivities in the 17th, uh, 18th, uh, 19th centuries. So uh, then we, we see the emergence of this, this kind of narrative that is devoted just to the event itself. Now, when we look at Ottoman historiography, I mean, you know, there are universal histories, there are regnal histories, there are dynastic histories that are devoted to the history of the Ottoman Empire. Also, uh, from the late 15th century onwards, we see the emergence of narratives that are devoted to single events, but these are usually campaigns. But in the case of this particular imperial festival, we see the emergence of these single event focused narratives that are not about campaigns, but about a, an, an, uh, an event that, that's very much like, like a festival. Uh, but not only that, we see different kinds of books of festivities that emerge in the case of this particular event. As you mentioned, we have one author who is a historian, uh, who is known as a historian and as a literateur uh, at large, uh, who basically produces a thematic account of the event, you know, types of festivities, types of activities. This is, this is his organization. We have two other narratives that basically tell us about the event uh, from a chronological perspective. And then again, there are all these uh, different linguistic registers uh, that you encounter in all of these uh, three narratives. Then we have the uh, account of the event in larger sources of history that are produced shortly after the event. I mean, there are other later accounts, but I wanted to make sure that I would only focus on narratives and records that were produced by people who saw the event in person. Because, you know, I wanted to emphasize the experience of the authors and the recorders instead of, you know, uh, the interpretation of the event in, in later centuries. That's, that's another, uh, that's the subject of a different discussion. So we also see, thanks. So we also see the description of the event in two uh, larger books of history. One is, uh, is uh, Regnal and the other one is a universal history. And so in these, in these uh, more historical sources, what is important is uh, that, that I seem to see a kind of uh, separation between the panegyric style of the sources that only describe the event and history per se or history as such. And what is interesting is that one of the authors who produced one of these narratives about the event is also the writer of one of these later histories. So we have two different narratives of the event uh, by the pen of the same individual. And interestingly enough, in his historical book, when he talks about the event, uh, he gives a very short summary and he says, you know, uh, actually, he uses this very like classical Arabic grammatical uh, notion. He calls it an utnab, pleonasm, right? He says, 
it, this is this is just you know I could keep talking about this, but in the context of a work of history, this is just you know too much. This would be you know uh, just a waste of time, waste of space. So I basically wanted to corner the event and talk about it as it, it was recorded through different kinds of sources, and also because I mean these uh, different sources are utilized by different kinds of historians in order to write different kinds of history. I also wanted to bring together the narrative, the archival, and the properly historical, and to look at you know, how this event emerges out of all this. Now, uh, to come to your questions, uh, obviously, and I, I recently published an article about another uh, public ceremony. It's in the uh, latest issue of the American Historical Review. Uh, so, I mean, if I, I would like to refer to, to those of you who are more curious about this, this subject to my article in which I talk more about circumcision and about gifts and materiality. Uh, so it, I mean, it, it, it is, as you said, I mean, circumcision is a very gendered practice, and in this particular case, in the case of the Ottoman dynasty, it is being utilized consistently from the mid-15th uh, mid to the late 16th century in order to you know, re, uh, mark the specific masculinity of the, mem of the male members of the Ottoman dynasty as they reproduce uh, biologically through concubines instead of you know, legal marriages or marriages of alliance or anything like that. So that's, that's the point when you see the, emer the coming to the fore of the pr practice of circumcision as the main Ottoman dynastic event when the, you know, the practice of uh, succession uh, changes uh, in, the, in the mid 15th century. The, Participation, visibility, invisibility of women. I mean, you know, this is this is a delicate subject. When you talk about, you know, uh, women in an Islamic society, there are all these prejudices. There's this historiographical sort of baggage that you have to deal with. I think in the, in the, in this case, you see a lot of women among the audience, the commoners who watch these festivities. There are a lot of records of you know women being present. Uh, the female members of the dynasty are also very much present but through illusions, through references. They are not visible, but they are visible uh, behind a curtain in their private spaces. So there are a lot of references to the female members of the dynasty as well. So, I mean, uh, it's not necessarily about the erasure of women, but it's about the constriction of women to uh, certain spaces. In the case of the elite women, you see, uh, you know, uh, women from the lower classes walking around, watching the ceremonies and all that sort of stuff. Uh, now, materiality, I agree with you. I mean, there is this Ottoman obsession with wealth, with objects, and what they signify. And again, I talk about it in my article a little bit. In the case of all these circumcision ceremonies, not only these gifts are presented, but they're also displayed in Istanbul's hippodrome. Mm -hmm. Because these are signs of the you know, refined culture of an increasingly globalizing uh, political and military elite. So in that, in that regard, I mean, this, there's, there's a, OK, I'm wrapping up. So there's a very mousy and you know, gift giving, gift exchange type of thing, but it's not only at that level. I mean, you also see the, the exchange, but more importantly, the display of gifts as you know, markers of specific cultural and political identities. You know, slaves being brought, you know, uh, all these uh, different objects from China, from the Arab provinces being brought to the Sultan and being displayed in the Hippodrome as really one of the uh, markers of the, the, the high culture of the Ottoman dynasty and the, the tastes of this sort of refined r ruling elite. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you, Shahzad. Thank you, Barbara. This is a wonderful idea and occasion. And thank you very much for the questions that you asked. I start with saying that I think the image is very temporal, mm. right? And very much. Um, um, uh, depending on how you're looking at it, can bring about exactly, uh, not exactly, very similar mm. temporality and movement. Mm. Um, and so I, yes, I mean, I, I want to push back on the distinction. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're right that what I'm looking at, the, te the text can, is both ossifying and, uh, ossifying and kind of fossilizing, but at the same time, I'm looking at it as a movement, mm -hmm. right? And really, not, nobody in my, in my 25 descriptions, nobody's literally saying, except Ibn Asakir, you know, I'm walking down the street mm -hmm. and then I, but the implication there that there is an itinerary. Mm -hmm. So I think you can do the same while you look at an image mm -hmm. to see an itinerary. And, it's, and the reason why I compare these two traditions, the, the word tradition from Damascus and the Dutch and Venetian one, is that they become schools that, and, and their paintings talk to each other. Mm 
So the, the idea for me here is that this tradition is all intertextual, and they're talking to each mm -hmm. other, and they're fighting with each other. They abrogate each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I will think about it more. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, I think there's a bit of hyperbole about like grabbing it from divinity. It's a matter of style. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but there's something extremely important about Damascus being released from a particular genre, which Nancy has worked on quite a bit, which is sacralizing a landscape in the past mm -hmm. versus giving it out and saying, OK, now you can walk down the street and register it in, in your time. Mm -hmm. So for the ease, you know, so it's revolutionary, I actually think. Um, and I don't know if I've, I've tried to push that uh, uh, point across in the paper, I hope it came through, that as simple as it sounds, it's actually revolutionary. And so the idea of being in the here and now and allowing people after you to do the same thing is, is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. So to say secular time and space, I think it's even under undermining it, mm -hmm. right? Because this is not a, it's the op so what Ibn Asaikir does is he opens it up as a tabula rasa for people to fill it with their own divinity all the time, mm -hmm. right? And so secular versus di uh, divine or secular versus religious, it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how to do, I, I want a new concept or word to talk about the availability of Damascus for anybody walking down the street to record it and to, and to read the tradition and play around with it. Mm -hmm. So I think here is a weakness that I could play. And if anybody has suggestions of how I could do this, I would be very grateful. So it's that movement from it being something always about the past to something that opens the present is amazing. Similarly, the same thing is happening in history writing. Mm -hmm. So all history before the kind of the crusader, you know, kind of that middle period was about the past. Suddenly, it becomes contemporary history. And it's about writing the events in the here and now. Mm -hmm. So these two things are happening at the same time. And indeed, most of these topographies are called histories. And they are a part, uh, at least Ibn Asakir's and Ibn Shaddad, a few of them are part of much larger works, huge works, in which biography is the center and not the city, right? Mm -hmm. So what is important here is that you have these compendia that are then parceled out, and the city becomes an object of its own with time. Mm -hmm. And no, it's not only the empire. OK, so here, the particular, the particular episode that I worked on for this paper, I think, speaks to empire or to the Mamluk empire. And I think also it speaks to the idea that Cairo and Damascus had been sisters in the earlier, before the Mamluk period. And they're competing. Even the letters between, between ulama <coughs> in one city or the other you know, kind of jokingly talk to each other about is the Nile better or the Barada uh, mm. River better? You know, and one of, one Syrian says, and look at Cairo the whore. <laughs> you know, I mean, literally they have these kind of um, flightings going on. So they were sisters, and then suddenly Damascus is downgraded, mm. right? And Damascus is never significant enough to be the queen, mm -hmm. and it's not insignificant to lose itself into oblivion. Mm. It had been the center of the first empire. It was the capital of the first empire. So there's always this defensiveness, this way of trying to protect it or make it larger or bigger or more important, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a chip on their shoulders, these Damascenes, mm -hmm. right? The other thing is that there is something about Damascus, and this has to be a subtitle that I have. All the cities that I, not, I mean, I, I, you know, there's a whole chapter about how e a lot of Islamic cities have received descriptions from Cairo, most famously under Makrizi and Ibn Khaldun, to uh, Istanbul and Latifi and all of these people, to Isfahan, to, to Cordoba, to, to Fez. I mean, I go through all of these. There's something about Damascus mm -hmm. where once this Ibn Asakir kind of gives birth to a genre, and the genre has been around. It's Al Khatib al Baghdadi mm -hmm. before him from Baghdad. But the way that he turns it to the present, he mm -hmm. turns it to the contemporary. From there on, it's continuous, it's intertextual, and it is about kind of updating the new and talking about the old a little bit. And each one of them has a very different agenda. And so that moment is a Mamluk moment. Mm -hmm. But there is a moment by the same author where he's turning against his teacher in his rendition of a suburb of Damascus. So the teacher is talking about it as the, uh, the, the, the kind of, um, as the Hanbali fortress of 
kind of these scholars building this community of hadith, right, of Hanbali hadith in Damascus. And this is the student who's a Hanafi, who's partaking in the same hadith activities, writes a sequel, but it's really an abrogation mm -hmm. to show how it's also a Hanafi and a Shafi'i place. Meanwhile, there are texts that are lost in the middle that I have to reconstruct, not only through this guy, but through an 18th century guy. So there's a lot of archaeology to be done in this, right? So what I'm trying to say is that what you saw is, a, is an application for a moment in time. And it's, it's, a, it's about how this tradition is responding to many things. So in this instance, he's responding to the bureaucratic traditions of Cairo and to the ma map cartography. Of course, I could be completely off, but the fact that the guy starts with that particular introduction and subverts nature in a way to make it a div divine creation, mm -hmm. right, is totally resting it back, right? And I also want to a little bit uh, um, uh, make light a little bit more. I think I did it very heavy-handedly about the imperial gaze of Cairo and kind of the efficiency of the, st the state was not efficient. Mm -hmm. But as a land-based empire, what they were looking for is, is revenue. Yeah. So it's not efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe I should rework that. Mm -hmm. But the attitude of the bureaucrat is bureaucratic, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so, and it's definitely the nature from to culture versus culture to nature. And so what is the, what he's producing, what they're producing is Damascus, right? It, uh, that was towards the question that you had in the end. As for the scholarship of Hadith, I am more, Again, there's something about Damascus. Mm -hmm. They are all historians who are writing chronicles, each a sequel of each other, right? Uh, or completing mm -hmm. one another. And they're writing as well these topographies or cityscapes. Um, and they're the same network of people horizontally and, uh, and vertically. And they're all doing Hadith. A lot of them are Hanbalis. I didn't want to get into that mm -hmm. <laughs> and kind of explain to everybody. A lot of them are Hanbalis. But what is interesting here is that the sequential, complete enclosure, encirclement of Damascus under their control, temporally and physically. Mm -hmm. So none of the traditions about the other cities is that closed and that mm -hmm. uh, sequential. There is something about it. And um, two people have, two Mamlukas have read this paper that you've read. And, and we decided we have to get together and talk about how Damascus is so self contained, self-presenting, and kind of sealed, fr trying to trying to compete with everyone and keep everybody out. Mm. So there's something very emotional about it. Um, did I answer all yeah, the questions? OK. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, so I think what I'd like to do, oh, yeah, let's give me one. Thank you. Both. For the sake of uh, conversation maybe flowing a little bit more, I know this room, it's hard since it's sort of everybody facing in one direction. But I'll, if you raise your hand and let me know you have a question, I'll take it down. And then once you hear the question, if you have a follow-up and you'd like to interrupt the queue, just raise two fingers so I know it's a follow-up question. Oh. And that way, hopefully, we, can, we won't Brilliant. have everybody just waiting for, really for their Brilliant. turn oh, to talk. All right. So please let me know with one finger if you have a question. OK. <laughs> I have four questions. <laughs> OK. And again, if you have a follow-up after hearing the questions, just give me a two-finger salute. <coughs> Please, be on the right. Uh, yes. Great. Uh, thanks. They were both, both wonderful papers. Oh, I have to do this. OK. Uh, for Dana, I actually wanted to ask about these itineraries. Hmm. Um, and you mentioned really briefly that for Ibn Tulun, um, he, when he's going through enumerating the towns and villages, he does so alphabetically. Mm. Uh, and I just wondered if you could talk more about that, because in terms of thinking about the way that one moves then mm -hmm. through the ruta mm -hmm. and how that compares to the way one would move through it if one were actually walking mm -hmm. uh, and from the bird's eye view that you mm -hmm. describe as mm -hmm. well as then on your the map that you provide at the end the way that the, the viewer can hover over or click over you know kind mm -hmm. of at will mm -hmm. and how do those different kinds of itineraries of moving mm -hmm. through this space then mm -hmm. um, reflect different kinds of, of politics different kinds of disruptions of the power of the of the state in the center and, and those sorts of things are we taking several or? No, I think you should feel free to. Uh, thank you for this question because um, I, I struggled in the paper to talk up to, 
So most of these, uh, if, if it's a long description, because we have long and short ones, if it's a long, big description, you can see that it is a series of, of, see, series of views, Walker's views. So I, you know, there's this mosque, next to it is that mosque, and then, so it's, it's really a Walker's point of view. Um, sometimes it's just enumeration of buildings without even any attempt to talk about an itinerary, but you can tell from the way that they're arranged that it's either by neighborhood or by, you know, so you can infer it. In, in this one, Ibn Tulun's, what is interesting is that he does it alphabetically, and so where is the movement here? But it's in each village. He talks about it has this and that and the other thing, implying a movement but never like Ibn Asakir saying, as you walk from, le so it's a combination of, of both. By listing them alphabetically and by telling you, this is what constitutes al ghuta these, these are the villages. He's looking from above, yeah. right? But by going into each village and saying one, two, three, to the point that he gets into a village and he says, it's, a, it's, a, it's now a ruin. I can't even enumerate anything. So there is a subjective, physical kind of point where he's standing and looking around. Even if it's not, he's saying, I'm not, even when he doesn't say, I'm standing here and looking around. So I think the aperture in each of these texts tells so much the, about the politics, right? And so the two, two works that I talked about, about the suburb of Damascus called the Salihiyya, one of them is moving according to Hanbali buildings, <laughs> while the other is moving back and forth between the three, right? So one of them is emitting, and one of them is allowing it to view. And that's where paintings would actually be a very nice um, juxtaposition. And uh, so the reason why I brought the state in from cartography to, it, it's just I noticed when I read the works that Elias Mahanna had worked on, you know, these bureaucratic things, you literally see the nature to culture versus culture to nature. And so that's where I had the idea of seeing them as talking to each other. I could be wrong. Ashwari? I, I just, uh, one which is, sorry, one which is directly a small follow-up mm -hmm. uh, to Sean's question about the, the relation that you see between uh, the spatial imaginary, uh, which is almost aerial mm -hmm. in its, in its uh, cognition, mm -hmm. and then the notion of place, which is more anchored, perhaps more, even more political in, 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 in mm -hmm. some ways. How is, how is this um, imaginary of Damascus, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, a, a vantage point to examine this relation between place and, and space? Um, or is this too far out? Um, no, it's not too far out, but I don't know what to say more than what I have already, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, um, if you visit each of these descriptions, there's always, I mean, everyone has a particular agenda. There is a place making all the time, right? And the only one that has an aerial view is Ibn Tulun, and then in the 20, 19th and 20th centuries, you have, by the way, that I, I, I take it till the 1950s, right? Um, and, so, and so that's when it becomes scientific and you know, very different, basically, although they're still referring back. So I don't know how to answer your question beyond what I've tried to do in that particular episode, which is place making in the way that he's walking each village, but at the same time, there's the distance of, this is a conceptual unity. And it's a conceptual <coughs> unity because al ghuta is what makes the, or, so al ghuta is what makes Damascus, but he's saying Damascus is al ghuta He's inverting that. So, so this is as far as I can go, and please, we can talk about it if you can help me think beyond yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Donna about uh, genre. You call this uh, a genre, um, which of course then draws in all the other things that might be in the same genre, yeah. and. At this point that you're talking about local histories in Arabic, I don't know, maybe 200 years old or something, this has been, people have been writing local histories and there's mm -hmm. maybe a mm. slightly less, slightly shorter history for Persian local histories. So I'm wondering, you've told us about how it breaks with those previous ones in this focus on the present. Mm. And I'm wondering if that's the only break 
Um, are there other breaks that are happening at the same time? And then I'm also wondering, um, do, do the people who are producing and consuming these texts also treat this as a genre or as a new genre once this break has, has happened? So the only other break that I know is in historiography, uh, in the writing of chronicles. And it's very similar. The way they do things is very similar, which is, uh, so the rise of Dail, <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the commentary. Not even commentary. Uh, sequel, sequel, yeah, sequel, sequel. Which is it's the tail end, literally the tail, all right? So this is in this period. So it ends at the beginning of the Ottoman period. So this is what is happening: is that everybody is writing on the authority of somebody else. So it's taking the isnad out of the book and you know from the book to outside the book and putting the authorities. So instead of doing things upon the authority of people inside the book, you start writing on the authority of people outside the book and continuing the project. So this is happening in, his, in history in general, in this period, and which is 12th to 15th century. And, and so people are first taking them together as like history and geography are, or topography are together, but also that it's taken as a separate genre in the sense that I found a lot of manuscript in which just Damascus by itself exists in the in the um, in Oxford and you know in, in different uh, manuscript collections and their pocket book their pocket you know their smaller books so what is fascinating to me is the difference between the tradition as the scholars are talking to each other in terms of popularity and how they refer to each other and what is circulating on the ground at least judging from the extant manuscripts the, the narratives that are circulating on the ground from extant manuscript, because it's not necessarily telling, is that really minor ones, <laughs> right? That are not necessarily big in my narrative. So this I'm gonna have to address at a certain point. Simultaneously that we know that Ibn Asakir's, his own, was, um, was um, uh, recited, uh, published, announced, recited, uh, narrated in the Umayyad Mosque by him and his, and his grandchild even. And we have thousands and thousands of people who listen to it. And we have comment, uh, kind of uh, marginal notes on, on these audition certificates, which includes a lot of um, artisans and things of the sort. So I don't know if I'm answering your question about reception and circulation. Yes. It is definitely seen as a separate genre because people like Ibn Tulun is devoting episodes to the, you know, markets of Damascus. Full stop. So clearly, this is a genre, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, the 18th century guy whom I work on, Ibn Kanan, is like, this is about Damascus, right? So it is taken as a genre, but altogether is looked upon as tarikh, as history, right? So geography becomes and is eaten within history, and the temporality is a part, part and parcel. So I don't know if I'm answering your your question, um, but the breaks, these are the two breaks, just because I'm not familiar with what happened in, in, in like astronomy or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not very aware of what happened in other fields of knowledge. We know that Hadith study is going through something very interesting at the time. We, we you know, recent work is, is, is amazing about that. Margaret. like to frame it as a question to to both of you so what are the practice of remembrance for which these texts are used so if if an author sits down and writes a surnama either of his own volition or because his patron has asked it how is he imagining that this text is going to be used in in the future so it is in some way it is written in order to be remembered so how does this remembrance Work and I find I just found it fascinating what what you said, Dana, that it's read out in a mosque and people are actually listen to mm -hmm. listening to that. Do you know how long that goes on, and mm -hmm. w what kind of use, what use of the of the text is this? So so who who are the people listening? Why are they listening to a text about about their contemporary city? Mm -hmm. So what what is the interest in not just looking at a mosque on on your everyday evening walk, but then going to, the, going to another mosque and having the recital, the mosque stands there at a moment that the mosque is still it's standing there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how is the whole question of, 
of memory and remembrance constructed. So how are the texts written into the future, into a part, into, into future where this will have become history? And what kind of memory does that, does that imply? Um, I think there's, uh, speaking of crisis and historiography, I think the Damascenes are feeling a sense of crisis the whole time, right? And it's really about, um, it's about, let's remember what the Umayyad mosque is about. And so Ibn Asakir's description, despite four fires that, uh, you know, and like how many problems, you know, the, the, the description of the mosque is actually transmitted verbatim all the way down to the 18th century. So there's something about the memory and the presence that play with each other and, and the canonicity of Ibn Asakir's um, work and his authority um, is transmitted within the, the structure itself. And that's an incredible tension that happens, right? Simultaneously, they don't want anyone else to take charge of their city. So they're always talking about the Umayyad Mosque as the center of, of life and the, the life, you know, kind of, and the, and the heart of the city. On the other hand, um, it's all about a celebration of new institutions or institutions of cultural tahdib. <laughs> so, so it's like the new colleges. The, so, so there's the preservation and at the same time the showing off of what is culturally important. Because it has an importance to, to what they are. To so what they are and what they are in relation to other places too, whether it's Istanbul <laughs> or Cairo, right? So I wonder whether you could elaborate on that how does a building infix the moral substance of the of the subject? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so is that something that you relate to the people who constitute the city, the living and the dead, and you also relate to the buildings because by interacting with them, by remembering them, that makes you a certain form of moral subject. And it's a citizen. It's also yeah. make, makes you a citizen of the, yeah. you know, so that, okay. that distinguishes between who, you are a Damascene and non-Damascenes, yeah. right? And so there is a preservation of the heart of the city despite the fact that they see the mosque changing, but they keep preserve the original author, authorizer, author of the mosque itself. And here we're not talking about Al-Walid, we're talking about Ibn Asak. So uh, in 1582, there, there are a number of different layers. Uh, first of all, there's this anxiety about competition with the grandeur of the past. There's, there's a major uh, celebration that happens in 1530, and the organizers and the authors in 1582, number one, are anxious to find out about you know, the specific details of that particular event, and they also want to surpass it both you know, in terms of the real organization itself as well as the, the description of the festivities. So there's an element of competing with the past, you know, with the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, the other layer is about the competing uh, versions of, you know, of, of, of a, a contemporary event. Uh, the palace itself is very anxious about creating a record uh, that will be kept in the palace itself and that will be utilized as a sort of record for future, by, by future generations. So uh, the palace actually uh, presides over the rewriting of one of these particular books of festivity and accompanied uh, with a, by a large number of illustrations. So the, the, the palace itself is basically tr uh, trying to create a record of the event and leave it to future generations. But in other books of festivities, uh, for instance, in one of them that was only recently discovered, we see a lot of emphasis that is given on those guild parades, the soundscape of the event, an individual audience member's experience of the event itself. So that's a, that's a completely uh, sort of different way of uh, recording and memorizing uh, the event as, you know, as, as a member of the audience. So, I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's, there's this attempt at competing with the past, trying to promote the present, especially in the official circles, and kind of trying to leave to the future generations a correct version of how to organize an event. And then uh, you have these uh, more popular uh, notions, uh, sorry, narratives of the event that kind of celebrate the increased participation of the guilds or what, what could be called the, the middle classes of the city. So the moment when the text would be used would be at the next circumcision saying what is the right way of... I, 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 ideally, yes. Yeah. 
Uh, if I could just insert a follow-up, and then I, I see one in the back as well. Um, I guess, I, then I wanted to ask more about this binary between the, the so-called divinity of the city versus mm -hmm. the secularity of the city, and I, I don't think you're terribly comfortable with those words. No, I'm no, not terribly no. comfortable with those words. And I kind of wonder what, what that implies, and I've been thinking along the lines of you know, sacral or salvific, like the topography of Damascus often, what in the, at least for someone like Ibn Asakir, what's being commemorated or celebrated is that these are places that will have significance at the end days, like the White mm -hmm. Tower where Jesus will return, um, as well as the, the sort of jewels in the crown of the city, like the Great Mosque, the mm -hmm. monumental architecture that demonstrates divine favor. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something salvific, sa sacral, mm. Um, mm. and not necessarily ossified, but interacting with time in a different way than what you have on the other side, which is the now, the experiential, mm. which isn't necessarily profane or secular, no. but is simply present. Yes. So maybe there's it's a differentiation along the lines of how time is being experienced mm. rather than the divinity versus the non-divine. Right there's something maybe or maybe there's something um temporal about how people were conceiving of of, of a right. sacred past and, and an apocalyptic future right. obviously versus a kind of a, a very presentist perspective on how to experience the place so that's one one question mm -hmm. i had and then the other one has to do with how we know about these cities and it seems like it's either monumental or like varieties of fruit that are grown. <laughs> there's not a lot in between. Mm. So there's something about the kind of hustle and bustle, the almost tourist pamphlet nature of these are, this is, these are the markets of Damascus. This is what they produce. Uh -huh. Here's the kind of cloth you can find in this quarter, uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera, versus the kind of much more austere monumental descriptions that we find uh -huh. typical in topographies that notice places of pilgrimage or major uh -huh. arteries or streets like that. So I wondered if you could say something about those two, it seems like rather extreme varieties in scale, and if that being what we have left maybe distorts our understanding of how these cities are, are represented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, co I'm completely in agreement of what you said earlier, and I just want to think about it more or even get suggestions of how to do this, right? Rather than sacred and profane mm -hmm. to find something else, um, maybe it's just temporality, but I needed to be open to this idea of allowing many people to participate in writing Damascus, right? Um, and so I, I need to think a little bit more, and I would love some feedback on that. May I jump in here? Yes. I, mean, I, I was thinking about something similar, because the, the first Muslim independent narratives about Damascus are, you know, about sacred geography, yeah, about yeah, yeah, pilgrimage yeah. places, and all this sort of stuff, and then in time, you see the development of these sources that you are talking about. I mean, is it about the emergence of a kind of, you know, civic or city identity, which is similar to, you know, late medieval or Renaissance Europe? Is it because these middle classes become more entrenched and they start producing these identities? Mm -hmm. But I was even thinking about the case that you make about the Mamluks and then later on the Ottomans, these empires intervening mm -hmm. and politicizing the present and mm -hmm. also politicizing the, the notables of the city as a result of which you see the emergence of these, mm -hmm. these answers. Yeah. So it could be about you know, the development of urban identity over time, but also imperial intrusion or central intrusion. Yeah. Uh, you see, I actually, the, the way I frame it is that this genre is a result of a social formation, which is kind of, I know it's, it's <laughs> I know this is what we, at least in American history, Islam, in, in, in the American Academy have we be doing, which is looking at the post-caliphate system mm -hmm. as the sultans versus the ulama. Yeah. And so the way that I see this is literally a contract between the sultan and yeah. the alam, and it is about the, the sultanates making a claim on the city through waqf, right? Mm -hmm. And building and creating the city through waqf. Mm -hmm. And the alam either being in a kind of a, a completely in in companionship with the sultan or, or, or pr producing a city that is completely yeah. different. Right, so, so the break here really is 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 a political, so it's very politicized to start with, right, and and that's how I see why the genre was born to start yeah. with, okay, um, but going back to your second question, 
uh, it is a very distorted image of the city. It is a very specific city. It's a very scholarly city. And the only non-scholar in my sample is this minor literati in the late 15th century called Al Badri. And he's lovely because he's going in the parks and gardens of the city and he is having, he's completely enchanted. He talks about the canteens, the blankets, the din of like, you know, the cooking, whatever is happening outside. And so he gives me a very different view of the city. It is lived and experienced daily and how they sleep for four nights in a row, you know, out, outdoors. And so it's a very alam constructed city and that's a part of my argument. So this is not the this is not Damascus. This is totally not Damascus. I know Helga had his hand up. Anybody else? Please. Yeah, this was oh, right. Um, this is for Dana as well. I was wondering, do you find examples of reflections about the writing might survive the city? That actually when you write the city, you contribute to, it goes to what Margaret was saying also, to mm -hmm. conserving the city. That mm -hmm. writing might be more durable, actually, than the city. And because it, it's interesting, I've seen that in architectural writing in other places, that there's this thinking that we, we, would, we think of stone as more durable than, than paper. But that's not, in the writing, it's not, that's not always the case. So there's this, often this reflection that actually, paper can survive stone uh -huh. and in, in that sense conserve the city. And it's interesting in, in your case because there's this obvious uh, example of how, they, how, how paper consumes the city, right? I, I mean, it exploits and consumes <laughs> the city that you're pointing out yeah. quite nicely, I think. So I'm just wondering if that, that other idea of conservation through writing was there as well. So I wrote an article, the only article that I have out on this topic is about the, mon it's called monumental representations, about, mo about Ibn Azaka's representation of the mosque mm. and how despite the fact that mosque changes, his representation became, becomes heav heavier than the mosque itself mm -hmm. and its canonical right. status, exactly. right? Exactly. And so I do compare it to the Temple of Solomon. You know, I mean, yeah. the idea that the text actually remembers the monument uh, uh, and it's heavier than the city itself. And I look at, so, so my article is called Ibn Asakir's Children about his own authority being so heavy that they, people who follow him and write the city have to deal with his weight. <laughs> and then, you know, they're not liberated till really the late 18th century where they, where they start putting the description of the mosque at the end of the book, not to start with it. Right. So he's so canonizing yeah. <laughs> that way. Exactly. Yes, yeah. so absolutely, this yeah. is a part of what I do. Right. It's, on the one hand, you're renewing the city, but at the same time, there's, there's this huge weight of a canonical text that is just, you know, kind of disturbing everyone. Yeah. I actually have a one-finger question as well, but I can do that afterwards if there are more two fingers in the sure. room. No, go no. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I, I just wanted to make an observation, really, because this is the only panel where there's no single author paper, right? So you're mm. both doing, all the other papers will have one or two papers that talks about the single author and the single work. It's just interesting that you, this is a different paper in, uh, pa panel in that sense, that one is, is focusing on the event. And I, I really like the way Kaya sort of pre prefaced the, this mm -hmm. his paper by talking about how this, this, this make us think about the event, which I think is incredibly mm -hmm. important. When does it start and end, like, and all these questions. And then it's the city, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it helps us think about time and history in very different ways, right? So it, we're not discussing modernity and tradition, for one. No. One <laughs> thing. We're not discussing <laughs> narrative in the same way. We're discussing multiplicities of sources in a different way. We're discussing sort of the immediacy uh, of the event yeah. and the durability of the, of the city and sort of the relationship between space and, and time in that sense. So it's just, it's not a question. I just wanted to make that observation that this is the panel where, where that sort of single author, single work uh, is, is not there at all. And I think it changes the discussion in an in, in interesting way. Mm. Uh, Shahzad. Thank you. So my, um, this is a reflection on Kaya's paper. Uh, as as uh, was mentioned, um, he and I discussed this question of the event, and I find it, find it very compelling, this narrative about the, the circumcision ceremony. But I'm wondering whether, um, how, Kaya, how would you feel about if, if, if I try to liberate the event from Ottoman history? Uh, because the way I see it here, because um, one of the most interesting things about this event is precisely that we have multiple types of sources, and even in different types, there are multiple genres involved, right? Uh, 
Now, so if we understand it in the, as an Ottoman event, so then the explanation is precisely goes to Ottoman um, dynastic legitimacy and other things that, that have been pointed out, including gender and so on and so forth. But another way that was occurring to me to think about is that what it is proving is that event is a completely empty category. Because all these people are trying to do is to actually put a boundary around a bunch of things that happened and c try to call it an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're putting exactly. different boundaries and around them, and they're competing about what the boundaries are. First of all, the thing that goes on for a month and a half, what kind of an event is mm -hmm. it is, is brings into the question, right? So I, if we take it out of the Ottoman context and if we think that we have all this material about this event, um, then is it possible to put the internal relationships um, of what is inside the boundary of the event in, in different cases um, in contradistinction to each other mm -hmm. to try to explode the very notion of what an, how an event relates to history or historiography yeah. in, in some way? You're allowed to answer. You don't have to raise your hand. No, I want a question. I want to. No. Um, no, it's a question. It's a, it's a follow-up question, which is I I noticed that the three texts that you have, yeah. the Surnames, they you know kind of the way the, the the gradation of not the gradation the the sequence of events is the same. Yeah. The yeah. issuing of the invitation, the whatever the exchange exactly. of gifts. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. and so what kind of ev you know constituents of an event or what kind of e separate events are these? Yeah. Just. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Can I, can I pile on this one? Well, <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, so, I, um, so I had been thinking along the same lines, but um, I want to offer an alternative to the circumscribing of surrounding uh, and offer a circumcision uh, in in the way that uh, your discussion of constructing an event uh, works with what a comment Anne said about a history of erasure mm -hmm. alongside a history of presence in regard to the male body. And in yeah. this way, yeah. the constructing of the event is a cutting. Yeah. It's a displacing of the it things is. you don't want to have yeah. there. Yeah. It's yeah. a marking, so it becomes event and not quotidian. But also, in your particular case, it, it is decidedly male. But where I'd want to follow along Shazad's line is to ask whether this might tell us something about uh, the masculine nature of history in of the course. way it's defined what yeah. events are in this cutting, marking, and, and shaping. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And was your question part of this matrix, or did you want to wait? Uh, no, I mean, ec ec excellent question. So one way of liberating the event from Ottoman history is to use theory as inadequate as, you know, uh, th uh, these uh, Europe-based theories mostly may be. So I tried to do that in the article, you know, to talk about ritual theory, Catherine Bell and ritualization, to talk about performance theory. So uh, one way of liberating this from Ottoman history could be, you know, by using theory and by looking uh, at the event as a closed event and as, as this sort of like box of different activities and, you know, uh, basically looking at the uh, relationships, hierarchical relationships, the level of negotiation among different constituents of the event. So uh, we could we could we could do that. But then again, I mean, historians would keep asking questions about you know how to contextualize it and this and that. I guess I mean this your question and my partial answer to that illustrates one of the challenges that we have, not only in this workshop, but in the work that we do. I mean, on the one hand, you know, all the participants here are very eager to go beyond their, you know, beyond the narrow boundaries of their areas of specialization, but at the same time, it, it is a scary proposition because, you know, how do you, how do you use theory, how do you use comparative perspectives uh, as, as you get out of it? Uh, so in the case of the three surnames, uh, obviously, you know, I don't have enough space uh, to talk about their contents, I agree with you that, I mean, they do describe the same event in its general contours, but at the same time, when you read them, they are very kaleidoscopic. I mean, or the, yeah, the, no. the image that you get at the end is very kaleidoscopic in the sense that uh, you get completely different impressions mm -hmm. about the event itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy who is closer to the palace in Tizami, uh, and I mean, these are not, I mean, he, he does disclose a number of negative things, a couple of fights break out, so these are not, completely sanitized text, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, in the narrative of Intizami and then in the accompanying miniatures, mm -hmm. you see a very sultan-centric event. If you were to read only Intizami, you, you would get the uh, impression that, you know, the main 
flow of action was around the Sultan and the members of the ruling elite. Uh -huh. But when you look at the other guy, Farahi, you get the impression that the main uh, flow of action is based on the movements of these uh, members of the guilds, members of the confraternities, these civic parades. So you basically get different slivers of the same event, which, which makes it you know, even more interesting because mm -hmm. the, the contours are the same. The issuing of the invitations, uh, the preparation of large quantities of food, everybody comes to Istanbul's hippodrome, but then you start the changing of these, uh, these different points of view. Uh, to, uh, one more thing in answer to your question. I mean, t talking about you know, the event itself as a cutout or as something that is cut in these sources and talking about masculinity and this and that. I mentioned this before. I mean, before this uh, particular festivity, the only events for which we have independent sources are military campaigns. So you could, in a sense, you could see this event itself as being yet another sort of military campaign, number one, in terms of the resources that are devoted mm -hmm. to it, this is organized very much like a military campaign would be organized. Collection of resources, mobilization of different constituencies, and also in terms of the display of masculinity, this is a very military event in that regard. But at the same time, because it's in Istanbul and because of all these guild parades and that kind of stuff, the civic element of the city leeches into these kinds of events, while it would not be present during a military campaign to that extent. Yeah, I guess I wanted to just, um, yeah. um, in response to Dana's um, issue around divinity and mm -hmm. uh, how to talk about it, um, it's a larger question because I think temporality is key in many ways to mm -hmm. thinking about um, mm -hmm. religion. Mm -hmm. um, but I also just am so struck by um, your, your idea of the now, right? Mm -hmm. That what is really happening here is a new kind of positionality of the person's the subject mm -hmm. that is writing and the relationship to time as now, uh -huh. and we've seen newness in the uh -huh. prior panels. And I, is that, uh, so how, what, 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 what does that mean? What is that, how does that relate to the writing of history then? Um, what's hmm. the relationship between now and the, the act of writing? It's making things your own. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So when you're writing about now, it's around you, right? So it's making your, uh, and, uh, and please, I'm not talking about the modern self. I'm not, you know, that's not my thing. But it's very Renaissance to me, sounds like, right? The present, the immediate present. The present, and the fact is, since you have the authority to talk about your now, it's really about putting yourself in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is where the, so they owning Damascus in a way that they'd never owned before. They're putting themselves in Damascus in a way that they had never been before. So that's, I think, the significance uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on that level. Mm -hmm. could, could I ask a question about the, um, the heaviness of the, the narrative of the mosque, for example? And I wonder if we could insert a kind of a, a more mundane understanding of how we inhabit monumental spaces as humans who generally don't grow, grow above six feet tall. And by that, I mean the reason ekphrastic texts um, sort of where they happen in the first place is to describe things that most people would never get to actually lay their eyes on. Mm. And even if you live in Damascus, and as I say this, I just kind of want to at least note that I hope one day I get to go back and see that mosque again, mm. just to acknowledge the fact that we're talking about Syria. Mm. Um, if you live in Damascus, if you go visit the mosque, you can't see every detail on those no. mosaics. Oh, no. You need the narrative to tell you mm -hmm. what's there but not visible to you right. because mm -hmm. of the scale of this architecture. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. The same way there's a kind of literacy that's necessary for understanding the program in a Byzantine mosque that most people simply didn't you know, have to just read it visually. They have mm -hmm. to have the story narrated. Of course. This is the scene where Mary, you know, the Dormition yeah, yeah. of the Virgin right, is, right? right, right. So, and I think that I see a relationship between Byzantine ekphrasis and, as you know, descriptions yes. of, of monuments in Damascus. So I wonder if it's not so much that paper's heavier than stone, but that the stone kind of recedes w unless you have the paper to help translate yeah. it for you. The same way I was born and raised in New York, I've never been to the Statue of Liberty, but I have an idea of what that monument mm, is absolutely. about. Yeah. And I have a sense of emotion about it based mm -hmm. on what I know about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess I would question the idea that it's all symbolic narrative mm -hmm. and that it's, you know, but I think it's actually, it, it enlivens and animates the way people inhabit the physical space mm -hmm. in a very nitty gritty way almost. Well, that's why I would distinguish between text and image. That was what I was trying to get at. Oh. I think they do different things, right? right. And, and you can achieve different things through them. And one of those is kind of a sense of temporality. And, right. and then there's also access and so yes. there's, 
So there are differences between that's what I in my first comment I was So saying. thank you both. This is amazing because thank I'm going to use this. May, <laughs> yeah. may, may, may I briefly jump in? Another yeah. thing that you said, I mean, this is, I'm really amazed by your paper. You know, as an Ottoman is looking at it from the perspective of Constantinople. Yeah. I mean, all of this is very, very convincing. I mean, this will be an amazing project. So among so many things, I mean, Tarih Dimash. Yeah. Right? I think what we also see is that, I mean, history, late medieval, early modern, it's usually about human action. This happened, that happened, you know, the Sultan campaign somewhere. But what we see here is like the built environment itself becoming part of history, seen as history, mm. which, which, which seems to me, again, to be very important next to human because, action, you know. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Nasser Rabbat did write a mm. paper about this in which he said even the biographies of sultans become a role, uh, what is it called, a role of buildings. Like yeah, it, yeah, so it yeah, becomes yeah. such a measure of the achievement. So the mm -hmm. fear that you had in the Umayyad period about having splendorous uh, uh, buildings that yeah. over, you know, that are too much, yeah. and they, they're kind of, you know, they, they're, what are they called, Nimrodian, they're not, yeah. they're not Solomonic, they are actually exceeding yeah. the piety. Yeah. Yeah. In the Sultanic period, they become actually a measure of success. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, the whole waqf, in, you know, the whole endowment business happens then, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. so, and so certainly buildings have lives of their own yeah. Yeah. in relation, and so that's why I think the scholars are writing it precisely to take the buildings away yeah, yeah. from the name of the state mm -hmm. and the sultan. They yeah. really want to take it and make it their own yeah. and say this is where our culture, that's where we produce our knowledge, right? right? Mm -hmm. So all of this is great. I mean, it just adds kind of way to, for me to clarify what I'm talking about. We have about. time for a final question and a short answer. Please. Yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to come back to this uh, positionality of Ibn Asakir that you're trying to work out. And I've, uh, through the presentation, through the discussion, I've been thinking about it. And like you said, you, you need a better term or a better concept than profane or secular. Yes. And I think, um, so trying to think with you, like I thought about, you know, immanence, for, for example. Immanence. But, uh, like immanent, like in the here and now. But the, oh, I see. But mm. then the problem is that the distinction between immanence and transcendence has itself a history, a modern history is right. charged, highly yeah, charged. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's the case with all these terms that mm -hmm. invoke this distinction of yeah, the yeah, yeah. worldly and the otherworldly mm -hmm. that have a pre-modern history, but our reading now is we, we cannot escape our modern context. Mm -hmm. So there it's all, um, so, my uh, my plea would be to that th this is or when when I read your paper I thought okay this would would be an interesting moment to challenge this whole history of of these concepts or look at the history of these concepts and rework them or like to to think about okay what to fr starting from the question how can we adequately describe the positionality we mm -hmm. find in Ibn Asakir's text mm -hmm. you know not saying well it's not secular because that's modern it's like pre-modern but mm -hmm. like what is the kind of adequate uh, architecture, conceptual I would architecture? Love something, yes. So, and I think that's not a matter of choice of words, but then like to look at the conceptual mm. legacies, you know, uh -huh. you know, with all these ter that connect these terms and so on. And I think that would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. so. I don't have an answer because I think I absolutely agree with you. This is wonderful. <laughs> Well, that's not a bad note to end on. Yeah. Sort of more to think about. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists one last time.